So, uh, <laughs> I think inflation is a is a good model for the early universe. Um, I agree with Robert that inflation has some issues. Um, I disagree with the criticisms that uh, have been put forward uh, about the initial condition, especially by Steinhardt. And, and I also, uh, I think, disagree with the criticisms on based on the multiverse. So I agree with Robert on that. Um, for me, the main issue is the question of the uh, inhomogeneous initial conditions. So if we really start from uh, situations where, uh, I mean, everything is inhomogeneous of the order one perturbation and so on, do we naturally get inflation? I think this is the main issue because if we have a model that does not lead to something which is homogeneous, then I think we have a problem. And is it the case for inflation? I think the fair answer to this question nowadays is I don't know. Because, uh, because, because it, as Robert said, it, it requires uh, numerical calculations. And, uh, and, and, and these numerical calculations, I think, are very complicated. So now there are new papers on, on, on the web which seems to indicate that indeed we do get uh, homogeneity from arbitrary inhomogeneous initial conditions. Um, but I'm not sure that this is the complete answer to that question. And I, I think, in fact, I know that uh, other papers will come soon on the web. But for me, this is the main issue. And th the only thing I can say is, uh, at the moment, I don't know about, about this <laughs> issue. But I think it's very important for inflation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me, um, one of the key things, particularly having seen Jerome's talk, is that there are a real plethora of inflationary models. There are a whole bunch of different models which all give rise, or are cooked up in some cases, to give rise to this, ex this expansion. And I think one of the key things to do here is to separate the geometrical effects of inflation, that is the almost acidous phase, this ex accelerated expansion, from the model that actually causes it. So it seems that all our observations actually come around just because there is this accelerated expansion. And the sort of the hard part is cooking up the right-hand side of Einstein's equations to cause this to happen in some sort of natural way. Or indeed, altering the left-hand side, introducing um, higher-order terms, or perhaps something that descends from string theory, which should correct perhaps both sides at the same time. One thing that really sort of strikes me as we talk about the uh, initial conditions and the homogeneity is one of the arguments we always make is if the universe is hom inhomogeneous, you know, we have these conditions that wiggle, we expand them, and that should somehow make them flatter. But of course, that sort of presupposes that as you zoom in, things don't become fractal. You know, perhaps if we zoom in on these wiggles, there's just wiggles on wiggles, and as we make these larger and larger, it could well be that things remain inhomogeneous even as we inflate. So... I'm not quite sure how one can get around that kind of problem, particularly with um, these having sort of a transplankian origin without having a full theory of quantum gravity. Okay. Yeah, so for me, the basic issue is is inflation actually right? So, personally, I'm not so interested in what is the precise model of inflation, but I would like to see is. It, did the early universe go through a phase of inflation or was there something different? Okay, let me um, address one of the challenges that I got from the audience in my talk. So the, the issue is, does inflation actually come out of string theory? So this is a question that I started thinking about back in 1988 with Kumun Waffa. And then what we did, we found that it was not so obvious. And it's particularly not so obvious for someone who's not a string theorist, like myself. And so to gain some illustration about this, you have to get some illustration of what strings really mean. <coughs> 
So in string theory, the fundamental objects are not point particles, but elementary strings. And elementary strings have things which point particles don't have, namely vibrational modes. And secondly, they can do to space something that point particles cannot do. They can wind space. OK, so now, if you take a <coughs> box, so if you take a box of strings as opposed to a box of point particles and you plot the temperature of this box as a function of the radius of the box and I'll plot log of the radius then you find that initially as you contract the box the temperature rises and the temperature levels off there's a maximum temperature and then the temperature This is a very different behavior than what happens in if you have a gas of point particles, where the temperature as a function of R has a similarity. There's also a duality associated with string theory, which says that if you take space, which is compact in all dimensions with a radius R, then R is completely equivalent to one of R string units. So measurements cannot distinguish between strings on a space of radius r and a space of radius 1 over r. So um, therefore, if you are now a physical measuring apparatus trying to measure the length of space, the radius of space, and you have this topological space with the radius r, and you want to measure the physical radius, then what you will find is something like this. OK, so this comes from elementary considerations of the new degrees of freedom of string theory and the new symmetries. And you see that this is so fundamentally different from what you get if you throw out the strings and just take point particle field theories. So this is the origin of string gas cosmology. And indeed, string gas cosmology not only predicts this different evolution of the early universe, but it gives a different uh, scenario of structure formation, which is in agreement with all of the observations. In fact, if you look up, so we use thermal fluctuations in the early universe. So we, the thermal fluctuations are set by the string scale. We go look at the Bible of the 1980s of string theory, Green, Schwartz, and Witten, it tells us what the string scale is. We compute the microwave anisotropy, so we get the Kobe amplitude. So somehow, to me, this is a very attractive alternative, which comes from fundamental principles of string theory. So there are lots of open holes. This has not been developed. It is not a consistent effective field theory. Inflation is a consistent effective field theory. But this is appealing to me. Uh, sorry, so uh, let me ask, so what's the connection to inflation here? Because there is no inflation. This is an alternative model of the early universe. Yes, okay, but, so, but you started off with... I started off by making statements that the proposed string inflation models are not solutions of the high dimensional equations. So there's no... <coughs> no. So you see, we were, back in 1988, we were looking for embeddings of inflation into string theory. But we found this. This is not inflation, it's an alternative to inflation. So this is a good point to open up discussion. So, any? Well, so, okay, so I mean, so I think nowadays, I mean, we've gone a lot in string theory since 1988. Yeah. I mean, there's been lots of uh, development, and I think by now, especially like the papers by Descupta and collaborators you were referring to. Um, and the ones by Saf Sethi and collaborators? Um, yes, okay. But I think so. There is definitely not a 100% agreement within the string community. Okay. I think that's, that's clear. And since I'm not a string theorist, I cannot. Yeah, <laughs> but, and I think one should say always that, that these things are there. Yeah. But, um, like, my perspective, I mean, I can also say, <laughs> and that is that uh, I think there is 
there are very well motivated scenarios which where people claim that they understand the 4D effective field theory, but that the 4D effective field theory is completely under control. Yeah. And within these frameworks, they have developed uh, models of string inflation. And, uh, Th this I agree with completely, what you said just a second. So, and, uh, but so I, I, I don't really see, you know, that you know you should completely throw away string inflation or string models. I mean, there, there's clearly a role, I mean, there are clearly questions that you know, within the community one one addresses. Yeah? But uh, it's not something where you could say, uh, okay, string inflation doesn't work. It doesn't predict anything. I mean, that's uh, so the challenge to me would be to have a string inflation model that consistently comes from the 10-dimensional theory. Okay, yeah, and people have made such claims, right? So yes, they have made such claims. claims. It's always in how, how explicit you are with, with the explicit string construction, right? There are always factors of order one that are assumed to some extent because we don't start from a up in each string calculation, right? Uh, but they are as explicit as starting with a given Calabria manifold and having a given brain configuration on this and then studying the 4D effective field theory. Is that yes, so that and my challenge is to make the link to derive the 4D effective field theory in a consistent way from the overall string theory. That's a challenge. And that's, I think, is a lot of the community in the, in the string, in string theory would say they do that. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, I've, yeah, I've heard other opinions from the people I mentioned. Can I just ask some uh, <coughs> different questions, Robert? You, you mentioned uh, there was a, a problem with the sort of transplanting uh, problem <coughs> in the sense that, if I understood correctly, that the fluctuations sometime early on during inflation had scales which were smaller than the Planck scale. Did I understand this correctly? Yes. So this, uh, what, what window of E folds affects that? Is, that? is that sort of 60 E folds before the end of inflation? Okay, so, so the statement is that if the energy scale of inflation is the usual one, namely that around ground unification, okay. then if inflation lasted for more than 70 E foldings, then everything we observe today was smaller than the Planck length at the beginning of inflation. Right. So, so you would argue that calculations of fluctuations based on standard gravity and the usual way of quantizing it are unreliable in this case? Yes. In fact, that's papers that we wrote. Right. And any ideas how to fix that? Well, see, for me, it's not a problem. It's a window of opportunity. Sure. But any, any, have you looked through the window? Well, <laughs> but, but, so we explored it in a very pedestrian way, so Jerome and myself. We just assumed that there were dispersion relations which were modified on physical wavelengths smaller than the Planck lengths. And then we found that there are certain deformations of, of the dispersion relation which give different predictions. Mm. Does it ruin scaling variance? Yes. It can ruin skin in that. Mm -hmm. But one has to say that there are other parameterization right. of physics beyond the Planck scale, which does not, I mean, modify scale invariance. Right. So it, now it really depends on what you assume mm -hmm. on scale smaller than the Planck length. Mm -hmm. But there are modifications which completely sure. modify the, the result. It's true. <coughs> so you see, this might be um, disappointing to cosmologists to do observations. No, it's but, but I think it should, be, it should be very promising for people interested in fundamental theory. That's why I'm asking. Because it means that if indeed inflation comes consistently from string theory, you might be able to probe details by, by making detailed observations. OK, so let me ask, since you've used the words observations, um, you've talked about observations of the amplitude and the um, scalar spectral index. Um, I suppose in the future, let's say in five years, we also measure the gravity wave amplitude and the tensor index. 
and then maybe in, I don't know, 10 or 20 years, we measure non-Gaussianity, some value. If you measure all these numbers, then would that eliminate some of these alternatives to infl inflation, yes. in your view? Yes, definitely. Which, which ones would go out, out of the window? Okay, so let, let me be specific here. Simple inflationary models predict a particular consistency relation between the four observables that you mentioned. Forget about non gaussianis for a moment. Now, string gas cosmology predicts a very specific relation between the tensor tilt and the scalar tilt, which is different from what inflation predicts. So, so if, you, if you are able to measure the tensor tilt, then you'll have a handle at discriminating between string gas cosmology and simple inflationary models. So if you measure the amplitude of non-Gaussianities, you will have a way to distinguish between simple inflationary models and bouncing models. Bouncing models generally uh, predict fairly large non-Gaussianities. So, so I think, see, I, I didn't have a full hour, so I skipped through the uh, discussion of alternatives. But each of the alternatives I discussed has uh, relations between the observables which you mentioned with which you can rule it out in favor of inflation if the results come out in favor of inflation. But one has to say also that uh, it's already very difficult to measure R and it will be even <laughs> more difficult to measure NT yes. and that there are even people in the CMB community claiming that given the upper bound that we have on R today, it will be hopeless forever to really measure NT in the future. Yeah, but you see, this statement... Maybe not the blue one. Right, <laughs> this statement is based on going after the small yeah, tilt sure. which inflation predicts. Sure. So let's assume that we measure the tilt and we find some very large blue tilt. Hmm. So string gas cosmology predicts a very small blue tilt, not a large blue tilt. Let's assume that we measure a large blue tilt. This would be. Then we'd have to go back to the drawing board. We'd have to develop yet something else. Maybe it would be ba something based on strongly coupled string theory as opposed to weakly coupled string theory. But for, co for the consistency relation of inflation, so NT uh, yeah. is minus R over 8, yeah. I think we can already say that it, it will be very difficult to check it given the upper bound that we already have right. on R. Right. So you're saying that if inflation is right, if yeah. the simple inflation yes. models are right, then it will be difficult to get an observational Absolutely. proof of uh, that relation. Absolutely. But since there are other models which are different things, it's still worth, very worthwhile to go after that. Sure. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Did you s just say that maybe um, inflation doesn't necessarily mean homogeneity? Um, just now, I thought you said that, <coughs> that it could mean other fractals or things it could not necessarily mean. I think if one, well, I've, I want to be very sort of careful about how I say this because you have to get these things right. But one of the things that we argue that inflation does is it makes the universe very flat. Is that it takes these perturbations and stretches them. And takes these wave modes and <coughs> pulls them apart. But of course, if you have, you know, sine of kx, you know, and you, you inflate this and th basically this is just decreasing k, effectively it's stretching this mode. But of course, if you have lots and lots of higher and higher and higher order modes, you know, if k goes, you know, all the way up, in some sense, you can, of course, always have perturbations of every wavelength after inflation, if that's what you so desire. You can always sort of cook up a set of initial conditions that will still have these perturbations afterwards. I mean, I wouldn't say, I, I mean, it, it does seem that inflation and homogeneity do seem to go together quite naturally. I mean, as Robert was pointing out, that it is... Homogeneity seems to be a late-term attractor about very small inhomogeneities. You can sort of see this by putting in perturbation modes at small scales. This is something Joe and I worked on. Um, and you do seem to see homogeneity. 
Likewise, you do seem to see isotropy as a late-term attractor. But I should say that these are also homogeneous isotropic um, things that you put into the right side into the matter um, component. You could, of course, put an anisotropic fluid as your matter source, and of course you'll get a late-term term anisotropy as well, even if you want things to inflate. So, I mean, really, it's <laughs> you, but you have a lot of freedom until you've, like Jerome says, until you've sort of narrowed down these models. And if the right-hand side of Einstein's equations is free, you cook up a lot to make the left-hand side do whatever you want. So, about the singularity problem, don't you think it's possible to solve it uh, even if inflation is right with some more inflation in physics that we still don't understand? So it's related to some quantum gravity. So there are models that, that, that claim this, right? I mean, the, 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 the most famous one in the literature, I think, is loop quantum cosmology, where you know, there's corrections to the Einstein equations at very high energy densities close to the Planck scale. And with these uh, quantum algebras, they find that, in fact, there is a bounce that comes around because, effectively, on short scales, gravity becomes repulsive in some sense. And so, of course, you can resolve singularities with quantum <coughs> effects. And I should say that any bouncing cosmology requires, by definition, a period of not just inflation, but superinflation, right? I mean, if the Hubble parameter is zero at the bounce, the universe is not contracting or expanding, and it has to expand afterwards, obviously the Hubble has to go up. So whatever causes a bounce in any bouncing cosmology, there will be some inflationary period. The question is, is it long enough? Is it going to be consistent with inflation? Is it a more natural explanation for observations than simply we add a scalar field and hey presto we get agreement. Okay, so um, I think we've reached the uh, end here. I'd like to thank um, uh, our co-organizers, especially Ma Michael Hicks and Rafael Batista and of course Roger Davis and um, especially David Sloan for stepping in at the last moment and our two other speakers for doing marvellously this afternoon. So thank you everybody and um, good luck with inflation. <laughs>